we are glad um, that Sheila J. Smith is joining us today. So welcome to the nonprofit show where we do have Sheila, president and CEO of 211 Broward. And we are talking today about the 211 helplines and what this looks like when it comes to connecting to the local nonprofits. So again, really grateful to have you with the Sheila, and I'm looking forward to learning more from you uh, and your 211 helpline in your community. Julia Patrick is here, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom with a new pair of glasses. Happy wow. Day. Uh, the nonprofit nerd. So these are my new nerd glasses for the day. I will take them off because even with these shutter lens, it's really hard to see. <laughs> yeah, but it looks good. I'm going to, in honor of you, I'm going to put on um, the nonprofit nerd glasses, which I cannot see anything. So I just have to do it for like a short period of time. That's right. It, I mean, if we can't have fun, what are we doing? Because as we were sharing with you, Sheila, we are coming up on 500 episodes and we are just so grateful to have the continued support from our guests as well as our sponsors. So thank you to our presenting sponsors uh, that allow us to have some fun um, and again, bring amazing guests to the table. We have to give a shout out to Fundraising Academy. To Tony Bell is the one that connected us with you and the 211 Broward community. So again, thank you to our presenting sponsors, to each and every one of you for leaning into our nonprofit sector as we all continue to navigate moving forward and what, what next is on our agendas. So if you have not checked out our sponsors, please do that. Not quite yet though, but in about 27 minutes you can. Uh, <laughs> dive into this conversation with Sheila. Again, Sheila, welcome and thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, this is really an interesting conversation that we're going to have, Sheila, and I love that you can help us navigate this. I think for a lot of us, unfortunately, um, we're not so familiar with 211. We certainly know 911, but 211, <laughs> Um, and so we're really going to dive into this because the, the, the integration of nonprofit service is really, I think, at the core of this, right? So let's start off if, if for those of us that are neophytes. What is the 211 system? Well, 211 is um, a national phone number that you can dial to get help with virtually any problem or issue that you're dealing with. So you're right, you call 911 for critical medical emergencies or, or those kinds of things. You call 211 for health and human service or mental health related needs, or you need to be connected with services in the community. And um, 211 is actually 96.5% covered in our country. So wherever you're standing, if you dial the 211 number from your phone, you're going to be connected with the 211 that's in your immediate community. So in a nutshell, 211 basically connects people who are in need with services that can help them. Um, you dial 211, um, you're going to be connected with a professional counselor who is going to be empathetic, who is not going to judge, who is going to listen to you, who is going to help you figure out um, where you might have needs, you know, the thing you called about and other things that might be going on with you or your family members, really just um, talking through whatever the issues are and making sure that you're connected with resources that are available in the community. It is anonymous, it is confidential, it is for anybody, um, including non-English speakers. All of us have the ability to do phone-based interpretation and we encourage people to talk with us in whatever language they're most comfortable using. That is amazing. I mean, I am just floored. I think before we even open our green room chatter, for those of you that are early birds and come into our digital doorways early, you might've heard, um, or actually didn't because we talked about this before we even opened the digital doors. Julie and I were stating that on the West Coast, because we both live um, in, in the Metro Phoenix community, you know, we're not so familiar with 211s more on the West Coast, but this stat that you just shared, Sheila, and I'm gonna round up, 97% of our communities across the nation are supported by a 211. Did I hear that correctly? You did hear that correctly, and we're even in Canada. So most of Canada is supported as well. 
That's and it's a very large 211 network. Um, it is independent um, information and referral organizations that answer the 211 lines. It's also, in some communities, a program of your local United Way. Um, but we are available to you and accredited. And no matter what 211 you connect with, you're going to re receive that same level of high quality, empathetic service and support. So I, I'm, I've got so many questions, but <laughs> my first question is because after all, we are the nonprofit show. <laughs> so how does the 211 system know or connect with, with the nonprofit services that are out there? Because, you know, 1.8 million nonprofits in this nation that are registered, that's a lot <laughs> service going on. I mean, is this the sort of thing where you would call and say, I'm new in town and I want to find out where I can get, uh, where I can volunteer or if, if there's a ballet this weekend? I mean, what, give us an idea of kind of the level that these nonprofits, you know, are working with. Um, so I can use Florida as an example. Um, we have a 211 network in Florida that's comprised of 12 different 211 organizations. Each of us covers a region of the state. For that region, we maintain a database of resources of those um, nonprofit agencies and programs that are available in the service area that we cover. So I can narrow it down to Broward, for example. We are a nine county region. So we have information about all the nonprofit organizations within those nine counties. And for us, that means about 1,500 different agencies and about 4,500 different programs. We have a team of people who do nothing but update those resources on an ongoing basis, day in and day out. They're keeping things up to date and current. And when you call 211 and you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have enough money to feed my to buy food to feed my children. And I'm, I'm only working part-time because the restaurant doesn't have enough customers. And we're looking for things like where, where are financial resources that are available to help this family? Where do you live? Where is the closest um, food network, food provider to your home or your place of work? We're using that database and actually culling the resources that are most appropriate for you. There are resources specific to veterans, um, to homeless individuals, to families who have a child born with developmental or physical disabilities. Um, as we learn more about you, we ask questions when you call. As we learn more about you, your needs, and your family, we can narrow down the best possible resources for you. Um, agencies we connect with to keep the information up to date, to constantly add new program information as services change and evolve on an agency level. Um, so it's really a network of partners where 211 is kind of that information keeper, if you will, and that, that gateway, um, both for the nonprofit sector and the people who need the services that they offer. Wow. Well, I have a question, and I don't even know if this is quite relevant, but I'm thinking, you know, if we're traveling, is there a need or is, is are we still able to call the 211 and, and receive help or services depending on what it is? And I'm asking if that's even relevant because I'm thinking if it's a short term travel, it might not be relevant, but if it's more of a longer term, how does that work for someone who's just visiting the community? So sometimes um, you end up in a community and you, you, you got robbed. I mean, anything can happen. Um, you lost your ID. Um, you don't know where to stay for a night. You booked an Airbnb that you thought was going to be a great place to stay and you get there and you find that it's not. Um, we don't really have the ability to know those private resources, but we can certainly walk you through the nonprofit kinds of support that would be available for you while you're here locally. And if you needed to connect with an agency for a child with special needs and you needed some extra support, um, you could connect with a provider in the community that you're located in. Each of the 211s also has a local number. So um, we are online through 211.org. Our resource databases are available to search online. So using that, you can search anywhere in the country, depending on um, where you are and where you want to find resources. Um, 
You can also dial the 211 local number that is in the community that you're from if you want to connect back with um, you know, the place you're from and not the place that you're visiting. Thank you. Let me ask you this question, and, and this is just more of a verification. You are specifically connecting the callers to nonprofit registered agencies or nonprofits, correct? Correct. Um, so we have inclusion criteria, so we're not keeping a resource database of private private providers necessarily, unless there's no nonprofit or free equivalent. We might have information about private services that offer a sliding fee scale, for example, or if there's no nonprofit equivalent. But we're really trying to focus on the nonprofit resources as well as the government sector resources in our databases. And you in particular, as we can see from behind you, you're celebrating 25 years. So again, was Broward County 211, um, as Julia said earlier, the pioneer of this? I mean, where, where did this originate or how early was Broward a part of the 211 community? Um, we've been a 211 since about the year 2000. Um, 211 started a little bit before that. Before we became a 211, like many of us across the country, we were an information and referral and crisis service provider. So we had done this before 211 became, came along. And when the FCC designated the 211 number, we became a provider using that particular phone number. So we had a long number before 211 came along. I love it. You know, it's really. Um listening to you, I'm thinking it's super genius to tag that, that 211 to 911 because so often I, I, I sat on a, a, a board where part of my training was to go to sit on the, the 911 board and mm -hmm. uh, for a shift to listen what was going on. Obviously not to participate, but just to witness. And um, it was riveting, riveting to, to hear what went on. But I did feel like there were a lot of calls that came into 911 that really, I, I hate to say it, but were a waste of time or resources to the emergency um, network, right? Um, and that mm -hmm. the 211 was something I wasn't even familiar with. And this was only like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me that it, maybe we need more education or is that just the part of the country that I'm in? What are your comments about that? Um, many of us, I think all of us, I would venture to say, work very closely with our 911s in our communities to make sure that calls can be sent to 211 when they're not appropriate and, and come into a 911 center. So that, that really helps a lot. Um, so they, they're like literally, like the 911 is like literally patching through calls to 211? Um, in, in many cases, they'll encourage people to dial 211 if they need extra support. So in our county, our Broward Sheriff's Office deputies actually carry 211 cards with them when they're out in the field. They have BSO information on one side of the card, 211 information on the other side of the card. They often, when they're out um, responding to whatever they're responding to, people are saying, don't leave yet, please. I'm, I'm having trouble with my son who's experiencing mental health difficulties and we don't know what to do. They're able to give out the cards, encourage people to call 211 and know that they're going to be able to reach out to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year and get a response and get help. So it's really a very close partnership between the 211 and the 911 organizations. Yeah. That is great to hear. And what you were saying in your community, uh, maybe I got these numbers right, 1,500 organizations providing 4,500 programs. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That yeah. is a lot yeah. of community members. So how does, and I heard you say there is someone constantly or someone's plural. <laughs> imagine, um, especially during these trying times, the last two, three years that we've been going through. And I'm curious, Sheila, if you could talk to us about what the 211 community has seen by way of trends and, you know, peaks, um, really where the demand has been and, and how that's navigated for where you are today. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's nothing like a crisis or an emergency, you know, be it COVID or um, a disaster in your own community or a hurricane to really highlight the importance of 211. And we find when these kinds of things happen, there's a lot of promotion across our communities, um, encouraging people to call 211. I can tell you that COVID, the COVID pandemic has been really interesting. I kind of expected that we would get a lot of calls related to the disease itself, but that's really not what happened. Um, the first two months of the pandemic, the bulk of the calls were related to for food and emergency financial assistance. You know, people losing their jobs and not being able to pay for necessities. After about two months, it radically switched. Um, the two on ones are kind of that canary in a coal mine. Um, we're the barometer of what's happening in the community. So we were able to say to our community, look, we're, the, the calls for food are off the charts. Um, the pantry's shelves are bare. And we had a lot of our local funders step up and provide um, for the needs of the food pantries. So people in our community were really able to get food and those needs plummeted because they were being looked after. Three months in, it was all related to mental health, um, anxiety, emotional health, um, struggles with, with families you can imagine. Um, a family in a domestic violence situation to begin with, now being enclosed in a house 24 seven, um, those kinds of situations we saw escalating. Uh, young people who couldn't go to school, who are forced into online learning, struggling with um, being isolated from their friends, elderly adults who at least were able to get out and socialize a little bit with their friends or attend senior meal programs or whatever it was, are now isolated at home, can't see their family for fear of catching the disease. Um, mental health, emotional needs across the board. We also saw an increase in suicide related calls. And that, that started soon after the third month as well. And I will tell you that as we've gone through this pandemic and we've seen the peaks and valleys, this last peak with Omicron, um, really, really hit people in a, in a way that was much harder than before. I think we were all thinking that we could put this behind us and it became very clear very quickly that we couldn't, this is not over. And people who might've been okay up until that point were, were not okay at that point. So even today, and we are two months in or two years in right now, um, we find that those mental health and suicide related calls continue to increase. So this is this is not over for people by by a long shot. No, it's not. And thank you, thank you, thank you for you and your your team and all the community members and leaders that play a part into this. Because you know you are you are one piece of the community, and all of us together are affected. And to know that pretty much the majority of us, ninety seven percent of the nation, has a two one one resource. So if nothing else, this has been a wonderful reminder uh, to all of us that these you know community resources exist. So uh, to make sure that that we use them. Um, did you? I would, yeah, I want to jump in here quickly because um, I want to talk about I have so many questions. And, um, but I, I don't want us to, to end our day and our time with you, Sheila, without talking about the nonprofit awards. And the reason why I want to link you back in is because Ms. Jarrett Ransom was actually one of your judges for this um, event that's coming up on March 3rd. So Jarrett, thank you for your service. But uh -huh. talk, talk about this. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear from you, Sheila, um, how 11th annual, but how this started and got going. Um, and yes, thank you, Julia. I was a judge and reviewed the, the proposals or the applicants that came in for four categories. So, you know, I'm across the, the country in Arizona and getting to read these proposals and submissions. So I was able to review organization of the year, the class. Mm -hmm the development executive, as well as that rising star. So four of the many, many categories that are, are lifted up during this nonprofit awards. So yes, Sheila, tell us, tell us more about this and, and how this got started. 
Oh, the awards are so exciting. We really wanted to figure out a way to recognize and acknowledge the work of the nonprofit sector. You know, we we make life so much better for so many people in our community. We lift people up. We we help. Um, we're a, a significant contributor to our local communities, both in the work that we do and as major employers um, across our communities. And we felt that the nonprofit sector didn't get enough um, acknowledgement for the important work that we're doing. So we created the nonprofit awards as a way to really highlight um, organizations each year in different categories who are doing exceptional work in the community and draw attention to the kinds of innovative things that they're doing and impact that we're having. And it's just been a tremendous event. Um, the, the nonprofits themselves have really appreciated the exposure and um, have built a lot of connections themselves, both among one another and connections with donors and corporations and others in the community who then go on to support them. We also felt it was really important that we um, give back to the nonprofits who participate in this event. This is a two-on-one event, of course, but it's really a bigger event than us. And we felt it was really important that everybody benefit from the event itself. So we do award grants. Um, we, we narrow it down to three finalists in each category. And then on the event, on the day of the event, um, the award, the winner is announced. The winner of um, the award, the winners each get a thousand dollar grant to their charity, and each of the runners up in the in each category receive a five hundred dollar grant to their charity. So to date, we've given back over two hundred twenty thousand dollars to nonprofit organizations in our own community, and that's just in Broward County. But um, you know, it it it's just a wonderful event in so many ways. It just lifts up and highlights the important work that you know we do in this in this sector and the contributions we make to bettering lives in our in our own communities yeah i love it and i julia you know i've served on other review panels before and i'm always i mean as the nonprofit nerd i always geek out or nerd out over what people are doing in communities, how they're serving, how they're collaborating. I was really impressed by many of the rising stars and to see, absolutely, to see, you know, up and coming leaders across the nation is really what we need to mm -hmm. invest in this global citizenry that that our country needs and, and deserves. So again, thank you. It's It's been, fantastic to be a part of the award programming and to, to witness how it's done. Well, thank you so much for serving as a judge. Um, I think I know the nonprofits pretty well, but every year I learn so much and, and are impressed all over again with just the extraordinary work that's happening on the ground. And I would encourage if there are other two on ones listening to this, it's, it's a great way to um, really build a lot of exposure in your own communities as well so that more people know about us, hear about us, and we're happy to share what we're doing if it's helpful to any of the other two one ones across the country. You know, I, I'm, I really appreciate you saying that because sometimes it's super hard to stop what you're doing and, and give all your information away um, because you're so busy, you're in the middle mm -hmm. of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I do appreciate and salute you for doing that because I think that's an amazing opportunity um, for probably many two-on-one organizations across this country and those that are watching us. Um, I ha we had a question that came in and I'm not gonna read it because it it's, it's um, maybe a little bit more specific than we wanna drill down mm -hmm. into, but, the question kind of was related to the overall structure of 211, and we don't have much time, but I'm wondering for those communities or those folks that are watching us who maybe don't have as strong and as organized of a 211 system as you do, talk to us about an, the overarching national structure. Because mm -hmm. you mentioned that when we first started chatting, that there is a structure that has been nationally formed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and give us some ideas about that. Um, so the 211 um, really falls under the umbrella of United Way Worldwide, which, okay. which was the first to develop the brand and to get the 211 number um, assigned for this purpose and use. There's also a national group called AIRS, um, Alliance of Information and Referral 
systems, I believe, and I could have that wrong, but airs um, accredits to one one organizations across the country. And the accreditation is very extensive. It's required every few years. And it really ensures that everyone is adhering to that same level of high standards for service delivery and organizational infrastructure and database um, proficiency and all of those different kinds of things. So 211s are accredited and people can be assured that we're able to manage whatever comes in. And you know, we're, we're also receiving crisis calls, um, people who are having thoughts of suicide or in some cases, have even taken steps to complete a suicide and we're de-escalating and connecting with mobile crisis or 911 to get someone out to the location. So, you know, what we do is, is really, um, it requires a, a very high level of skill to be able to manage a lot of what comes in and that accreditation assures that all of the 211s answering those calls have that same level of skill. I will say also that we, we have to raise our own funds locally. So with the exception of a couple of states um, that have invested heavily in their 211s, most of our funds are raised on a local level. So um, when people haven't heard about us, a lot of times it's because we didn't have the marketing budget that 911 had when they launched and everybody across the country knew what 911 was. Mm -hmm. So we raise our funds locally and, and generate a lot of um, support that way. And many of the 211s offer specialized kinds of lines and services as well. We, we call seniors on a daily basis just to do safety and reassurance checks. Um, we make 65,000 outbound calls every year just to make sure older adults who are living alone are safe and well. Um, all 211s are doing something a little bit different also to respond to whatever the needs are in their own local communities and areas. Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a nuance to that, figuring out how you can best serve your community. We talk about this all the time in the nonprofit mm -hmm. sector. I mean, how do we listen? Jared, I interrupted you. Sorry. I was going to say, I've got some work to do in my own community for 211 and um, various family members, right, to really understand what's in the community for resources. And I'm just fascinated and, again, just a little mesmerized by, <laughs> by yeah. everything. That is, is provided and included. So thank you again, and and to your team. Uh, Tracy also connected us and uh, has been wonderful to work with through the nonprofit award. So again, you've got a fantastic team, and so glad that Tony Bell with Fundraising Academy was able to connect us. Thank you so much. Hey, it's been great. Jarrett and I want to make sure that. Um, you have our information. Sister, pop those glasses on one more time. <laughs> I mean, I know. That, Fun. that's essential for this day. So thank you, Jarrett, for showing up. The best I could do are my red glasses. Hey, Sheila, thank you so much for joining us today. We learned a lot and you've really, um, I think I I'll, I'll say for myself, I think you really um, made me realize that I don't know enough about this in my own community. So I know that uh, I need, as Jarrett said, to do some homework on this. Really interesting. I, I can't wait to, to hear more about this as we journey forward. And I suspect uh, we'll, we'll get some more time with you in the future because this is a fascinating conversation that all of us on, on so many sides of the nonprofit sector need to be knowing more about. Um, here is Sheila Smith's information, 211-broward.org. Check them out. The website is incredibly, incredibly extensive. Um, and it really speaks to the needs and, and how these issues are being funneled through um, the Broward 211 system. Very, very interesting. Hey, Jarrett, make sure that uh, you are, are dialing back in for Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, Vimeo. I was out for two episodes last week and I caught up on Roku um, with you. And so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So make sure if you want to find us in some of the past issues, that's where episodes, that's where you can go. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors. Without you, we would not be here having this dynamic conversation as we have today. This week's going to be action packed. We hope you join us because we have a lot going on and uh, we want you to be a part of this journey with us. 
As we end every episode, we want to remind you, and I think ourselves, stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Sheila, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you.